Awesome. So we're going to start off service by worshiping together. I know I'm super excited for you. I hope you are too. If you want to sing along, you can do so by following along with the words that are going to be on the screens. After that, we're going to hear what's happening in the life of Vail. And then Pastor Sean is going to come out and share a great message about our risen King.
Good afternoon. Okay, I got something I need to share. There's Adam. Everyone say hi, Adam, back at the production booth. He's doing a great job. When this didn't work last time, it was my fault, not his fault. So I just needed to share that, let everyone know. Hey, we're gonna have a great time. Kristen, let all the new people know what's gonna happen today. Awesome, so we are so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend here at Vail, especially on Easter. There are tons of places yes. that you can be, and we're so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend here. And if you're online, we are so thankful for you as well. In just a few moments, the band is gonna come out and join us on stage, and we're gonna start off service by worshiping together. If you wanna sing along, which we highly encourage you to, you can sing along with the words that are gonna be on the screen. After that, we're going to hear what's happening in the life of Vail, and then Pastor Sean is going to come out and share an incredible message about our risen King. Awesome, awesome. We're going to get started in just about two minutes.
Easter at Vale. We're so glad you're here. We know there's a lot of places you could have gone this weekend. And the fact that you chose to come here and worship with us and celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty. We have a risen King and we can celebrate that together this weekend. Amen. Let's continue to sing and lift our voices together. We will lift our eyes. We won't fear the fire. There is one who's stronger. Heart pressed on each side, we will not lose sight of the one who's greater. There's one name, one name holds every victory. One voice that silences the enemy. One key who reigns for all.
break before you The demons run and flee At the mention of your name King of majesty The mountain shake Worship today. Man, we are so, so excited to see how God shows up this weekend. We're glad that you're here to experience it with us. So would you guys go ahead and take a moment to pray with me. God, we are so thankful for who you are. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to live for us, to die for us, and then to conquer the grave so that we can have victory. God, we thank you. We love you. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Man. Well, hey, we are glad you guys are here this weekend as we get to celebrate the greatest victory ever, a victory that you and I get to have because of who Jesus is and what he did for every single one of us. And it's because of what Jesus did that we get to celebrate a risen king today. And so as we continue to celebrate, let's listen to Hillary's story about when she got to meet her king. My name is Hillary Pacia, and I've called Veil vale home for nearly 19 years. Veil vale changed my life because when I walked through those doors for the first time, I only knew about God through rules, but this is where I learned about relationships. And it was through those Christ-centered connections, through things like sisterhood or joining a small group for the first time, even though that's scary, I found life wasn't meant to be alone and done alone. And so it was through that I found that support and I even started leading a small group because of it because I knew how intentional connection was so key to my relationship with Jesus. And then there was Rooted. That was by far the most impactful thing that I've done here at Vail. We're always talking about next steps and I didn't know what my next steps were. And then when Rooted came along, I knew that's where I belong. Because of Rooted, I started fostering children. And even in February, 2020, I started a nonprofit 
called One Hope Project, and that's helping people right here in our community who are battling eating disorders. I'm so thankful for all that Vail has offered here and, and ways to take next steps and get in community. But man, real life transformation happened for me when I made Jesus the king of my life. That's when everything changed. Man, well, once again, I just want to welcome you guys. My name is Corey. I've got the privilege of serving on the team here at Vail. It is good to be with you guys in the room. Those of you online, those of you in overflow out in the lobby, it is great to be with you guys today. Especially, we want to give a special shout out and welcome to our first time guests. Let's give it up for them. We are so glad that you are here. And I want to ask you to do something. If you are visiting with us today, if you could take a quick moment, get your phone out, text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677. We would love to reach out and connect with you this week. Now, if you're here in the room and you got elementary age or younger kids with you, I want to make sure you know about Vail Kids. Every weekend, every service, Vail Kids creates a fun and safe environment where your kids get to learn about the love of Jesus in an incredible way. And so if you've got them with you today, you still have time. You can head across the lobby. You can check them in. Nobody's going to steal your seat. We'll make sure that, you know, it's all good. But you can go check them in. They'll get to participate in their class, get to have an egg hunt, and have all kinds of fun doing that. But adults, we got stuff for you too. We want to let you know about two connection events we got coming up. Our next men's event is happening on Tuesday, April 9th. We're heading over to Gill Street to eat some food, throw some axes. It's going to be an awesome time. High school age and up, guys, we want you to come and bring your friends. Ladies, our next sisterhood event is happening on Friday, May 3rd. And you can find out more about both of those events and register for those through our website or through the app. Now, as we get ready for our message today, we want to invite you to look around you and say hi to a couple people sitting around you and answer the question, what is your favorite Easter candy? And Peeps is not an acceptable answer. 30 seconds on the clock. Here we go. How's everyone doing? You guys doing good? Good seeing all of you. You're like, I was telling my friends about my Easter candy. All right? Some of you, like, went too much. I like the Cadbury eggs. Anybody else like Cadbury eggs? There they are. We're so glad that you're here. Hey, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sean Jensen, and this is my first Easter at Vail. I'm excited to celebrate with you guys. So thank you, guys. I'm excited to be here. And so we also want to say hi to you. I know Corey already did, but if you are in overflow, we're so glad that you're here. And listen, if Jesus can come through that grave, he can come through these doors, and he's going to make an impact in your life too. So let's give it up for those in overflow right now. We want to let them know we're there online. We see you as well. Thank you for joining us. But we're going we're gonna to jump in here today, and as we talk about Easter and what it means, I just have so much hope for Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, because the tomb is empty. I just believe this is a day where people can get back up. I believe it's a, a day full of hope. It's a day of new beginnings, and so I'm just excited to celebrate that with you. Now, a few weeks ago, I actually picked up my 10-year-old daughter, uh, who's nearly my height, because that's not a great feat, but you know what I'm saying. Like, I went to pick her up, and as I was holding her, I was holding her like she was 10 weeks old, and I she was looking at me in her eyes, a little awkward, but I was looking at her like this, you know, that moment with her dad. And I was having this moment with her, and I said, man, this is how I used to carry you when you were 10 weeks old, when you were just a baby. And she's a very literal person, and so she looks at me, she goes, dad, I'm not a baby anymore. <laughs> and I was like, Avery, you just ruined the entire mood. And I dropped her. No, I didn't drop. I didn't drop. I promise. I set her down nicely. I promise you. I promise you. Do not text anyone and tell on me. All right. So the truth is, when we talk about that, uh, when it comes to being a baby, I can't treat her the same way I used to treat her. I can't treat her. I have to treat her differently as she gets older. She's no longer a baby. It's kind of sad, but it's true. And the truth is, when it comes to Easter, we have to kind of talk about it because a lot of times we treat Easter like it's Christmas uh, because Christmas is a time where we celebrate baby Jesus, but Jesus grew up. Easter is about King Jesus, 
And it's a little bit different because let's be honest, it's easier to celebrate Christmas Jesus. It's easier to control a baby, but you can't control a king, right? And so when it comes to King Jesus, it's something we all have to actually navigate that. Yes, he was a baby, but now he is king. And what does that mean in my life? Whether you believe or you don't believe, we all have to navigate what that is because it's a lot harder to admit we need someone in our life like a king who can rule us and lead us and who we can kind of submit to and trust. It's a lot tougher to actually talk about. And so in case you think Jesus is still in a baby, you got this picture of baby Jesus in a manger, or maybe you see Jesus with flowing blonde hair and a purple sash on, let me give you a picture out of Revelation. I know, it's Easter. I'm going straight to Revelation for you guys, all right? So we're going back to the end of the Bible. Some be like, yeah, let's go. We're going back to the end of the Bible, and we're gonna see a picture of what it looks like when Jesus is actually coming back to earth with his church to establish his kingdom. This is a big deal. Those who are with him will rule and reign forever in and this is the picture we get of Jesus in Revelation. It said, then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. Look, uh, a name was written on him that no one understand except him. He wore a robe dipped in blood and his title was the word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword. Come on, somebody to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Many crowns, dripping in blood. This is straight out of Braveheart, y'all. Did you catch this? This is intense. This is our Jesus. But my favorite thing is he had a tattoo on his thigh. And the tattoo, just in case, was like, I don't know if you should say that, Sean. Now listen, he had a tattoo, it said it right there on his thigh that said, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because the truth is, is we're gonna have lords in this life and there's gonna be kings in this life, but Jesus wanted to set the record straight. He is the king of all kings and he is the Lord of all lords. Whether we want to accept it or not, that's just his rightful place. And when that is his rightful place, everything else is in order. And that's what we kind of have to talk a little bit about today. I kind of want to convince us if you're here and maybe you haven't made Jesus king of your life. If you're online or an overflow and someone invited you in and maybe you're curious about this thing and we're seeing people head back to churches in 2024, people are curious about spirituality and faith that maybe just maybe Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords and why that is so important to our life. There's many people in this room who have made Jesus king of their life and they have seen tremendous rewards and examples from that but there are people who still maybe have questions about it. So I'm gonna convince you, maybe, the Holy Spirit will, I'm gonna take a moment to pray, to hopefully convince you that you would make Jesus king of your life and how that can change everything for you. But first, I'm gonna ask for his help. So Lord, we thank you for what you're doing today. We thank you for what you're accomplishing in this. Uh, Lord, I am just a man, but I know the Holy Spirit lives in me because that's what the promise is in your word. And it also says the Holy Spirit rose Jesus from the grave. So if you have to do some miracles today, do them. If you have to move hearts today, do it, Lord, because I can't do it, but your spirit can. And so give me your wisdom and your direction and let our hearts be open because maybe, just maybe, we need a king in our life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we're gonna actually look back to convince you that we need a king we're gonna look back in the Old Testament when the people of God decided they didn't want Jesus or God as king. And this moment, what we're gonna see is the Old Testament nation of Israel, God would lead them in different ways. He would protect them and guide them and he would use judges and he would use prophets to lead them and guide them. They would become rebellious and he would get them back on the right track. And so he would send specific people. In this case, it was the prophet Samuel. Samuel's getting older and his boys are not gonna follow in his footsteps because they're wicked and the nation of Israel is ready for a different king. And this is what we're gonna read about in 1 Samuel. It said, look, they told him, you are now old. Dang, right? Like, <laughs> talk about church hurt. And your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continued to abandon me and follow other gods, and now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but soundly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. 
And so as we look at this scripture, we see that in their request for a king, they actually reject the best king. They didn't know it at this time, but they had their eyes on other people, and they said, we need a king. But in the moment, they forgot that God had been their king. Even though judges and prophets were leading them, God was the one that set them free from Egypt. God was the one that delivered them from their enemies. God was the one that when they needed food and they were starving, he provided food when they had no food. He led them when they were lost. He lit up the darkness so they could see. He gives them the promised land, and even though there were enemies in the promised land, he defeats them on their behalf, gives them a place of rest, gives them a place to settle, and now they're saying, we want a king. They were actually turning their back on the best king. And sometimes I wonder in my life if I've done that with God, that sometimes I think I deserve better or maybe sometimes other things will be better. What if we are rejecting the best king and we're settling for a knockoff king? Like these guys, they wanted a king from Timu, right? Like this is like, or is it Tamu, the Super Bowl, and they changed all that up, by the way. Wish, it's a king from Wish, all right? But what if we're getting a knockoff king? What if we think this is gonna be the thing for us, but honestly, it hurts us in the end? And if you're here today, Sean, I don't know, we don't talk about kings and kingdoms. This is America. I don't understand what that means. This is what I'm trying to say. When we talk about king, we know that God's gonna have a kingdom that he builds. And we know that king has authority, he has power, and he's in charge. And a good king rules a great land. You wanna be under a good king. But there's a lot of things that aren't good kings that we try to submit to. And so what I'm asking is, what is ruling our life? And some of you might say, Sean, honestly, I don't need a king. Like, I really don't want to talk about that. Like, I really don't think God would be my king. And maybe that's your choice, and I get that. But let's just talk about this, because whether you need a king or not, the truth is we all have a king in our life. We all have something or someone that is ruling our life and making our decisions. And this day... Come on, cash is king, power is king, sex is king, success is king, status is king. All these things are king and they are ruling our life. And at the core, let's just be real, we are king. I want to rule my life. And I'm not saying that we don't partner with God in making decisions. I'm saying we want to be the ones who make the decisions. And I have found out in my life, I don't know about yours, but for me specifically, the one who hurts me the most, deceives me the most, lies to me the most, and has put me in the most painful situations the most has been myself. I make a lousy ruler. I make a lousy king. Just ask my family. (laughs) He's my husband. He is not a king. (laughs) All right. He follows the king, and that's why I do it, because I realize that I am here. And I hope you know if you're coming to this church, I am not your king. I hope that when you leave this place, you don't see more of Sean, you see more of Jesus, because he's king. And what we do is we want to rule our life, we want to rule our preferences, we want to rule our choices, we want to rule our identities. We want to rule this life, and we think that we're doing great, and we're changing things, and we're doing things, and what's happening is more people are becoming hurt, because we want to rule. And why do we want that? Well, the people in Israel has said because every other nation had a king. You're telling me that they had their eyes on the other nations that were actually losing to them and be like, hey, we want to be like them. Forgetting that they were not supposed to be like other nations. If we are in Christ, do you know what scripture calls us? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, meaning you're not supposed to look like everybody else. Can I tell you something? Everything else isn't working. And they wanted to be that. Well, let's be honest. The reason I wouldn't want to be king is because I want control. I think it's good to have control. I like to have control. I want to control everything. I think it's good to have control. And then I realize there's going to be people here all weekend who won't make it because they got sick. They couldn't control that. They couldn't rule over that. And some of us, quite frankly, like, you know why I want to be king? Because I can do what I want, say what I want, when I want. I get that. It's liberating. It feels great to do that. But then again, we deceive ourselves. And so I just want to convince you that Jesus truly is the best king, that he cares for you, that he loves you, and that maybe just maybe surrendering our control and choosing Jesus as king is best for us. Whether you've been coming to church for a long time and you need to resubmit that, or maybe you're here for the first time and your question is, or maybe you're like, I was told to come. I don't even want to be here. I was just told I was going to get a free dinner after I come. (laughs) 
I hope you enjoy your dinner. <laughs> Go to pop up, all right? But a few things that I can tell you about why I think King Jesus should be king of your life and they'll help. First off, he's a humble king. He is a humble king. Have you ever met someone where like the power goes to their head? You know what I'm talking about? Like their head gets bigger and bigger the more authority and power they get. Like they abuse their authority. Like I see this every time I ask my eight-year-old daughter to go tell my 10-year-old daughter Avery to turn off her tablet. I'm like, Charlie, I need you to go to let Avery know it's time to turn off her tablet. And you, you, you would think I told her that she is now the president of the United States of America. She's like, Choo, like trumpets behind her, American flag drops behind her, and she just starts walking up the stairs. Boom, boom. You can hear those steps. You know what I'm saying? Like, authority. She's like three foot, y'all. Like, this is like, she's going up. All of a sudden, here, Avery. Yeah, Charlie. Daddy says it is time for you to get off your tablet, or he's going to ground you forever and ship you away. I'm like, I didn't say that. Daddy, you said that? I'm like, sometimes I want to, but I didn't say that. She lets the authority go to her head. Have you ever seen someone allow the power to go to their head? Abraham Lincoln says, nearly all men, and this is the case for women too, nearly all men and women can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give them power. Give him or her power. You want to find out what's really inside someone? Give them authority. See, Abe Lincoln, one of the best presidents to ever live, he used his presidential authority to abolish slavery. He used his presidential authority to help the nation. And this isn't me trying to get ready because it's an election year. I'm just talking about a man who was an authority who was trying to use it to serve those in his care. Your humility is learning to use their authority to serve others. But some of us, if we're honest, we've been under some people, some bosses and some leaders who have hurt us because they've abused their authority. And some of you, it's happened in churches. It's been pastors and ministry leaders and they've let the power go to their head, and they become dictators, and they begin to use their power in abusive ways, whether they mean to or not. And maybe that's you today. And this is gonna seem like a plug, but it really isn't, because I think it's really important what our church is gonna talk about the next three weeks. Next week, we're gonna, we're gonna start a series called I Love Jesus, But Not the Church. And we're gonna talk about the church hurt that actually happens in the church and how we need to navigate it as a church. So if you've been church hurt, or you wanna be better at not hurting people, I think you should come. But as we continue on, we learn that Having power, it should come in serving those around us. The higher we get, the lower we should become. Amen. And that's who Jesus is. Actually, Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. He's telling them, hey, I want to let you know how church works. He says, don't put anybody, or don't, don't, don't serve yourself more than others. He goes, don't put your interest over other people's interests. Instead, put their interest above yours. And he says, and be like Jesus. And then he gives them what Jesus looks like and how we're supposed to mimic it. And this is in Philippians 2. He says, Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Let's look at first things first, and please don't say I'm the realist. That is over with. All right, so first things first, we're gonna look at this. He was God. Who was? Jesus. He was fully man and he was fully God. So he wants to set the record straight. This was not just a man who walked this earth. This was God who put on skin and bone. And he's walking amongst people, which means he has the same power and authority as God. But he didn't think of himself as equality with God. He had authority. He had power. God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus had all authority and power. So let's see how he used it. He gave up his divine privileges. What? He took a humble position, right, of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself, there it is again, and he died a criminal's death. This is how Jesus used his authority. That was my fault. I am so sorry. (laughs) You saw nothing. (laughs) This is how Jesus uses his authority. He uses it to come to earth, to live the human experience, to walk alongside of us, to wash feet, to heal the sick, to look over those who are hurting and broken, to lift those who are broken up. And then he looks at those who sinned and said, I'm gonna go to the cross for you. You might be the criminal, I'm the criminal today. 
and he pays the penalty. This is how he used his authority. This is what Jesus did. It reminded me of when my wife went to the Philippines for a couple weeks on a missions trip. She left America and went to the Philippines. And in the Philippines, it was a very, very impoverished place that she went. Um, and while she was there, she saw some things that was really heartbreaking. So she would see 10 by 10 rooms, 10 foot by 10 foot rooms made with mattress springs and trash stuffed in them. And about five or six families would live in these spaces, 10 by 10s. And these people would actually go to the city dump and they would find as much stuff as they could from the city dump, just garbage, and they would actually burn it all together into a food-like substance and then sell it on the street for people to eat. So people would eat that, and they would sell it, and that's how they would make money. It's a very intense place, and they were going to preach the gospel and help get people in there, get them into churches. Now, my wife only went for two weeks, but some missionaries go and they stay there. And the whole idea is that they go there to bring hope and love of Jesus and hopefully tell them about the story they've never heard, and that would bring peace and joy to them in the midst of their trial and pain. Why did I say that? Because could you imagine leaving America? Like, y'all, we got food and water. We got full meals in our garbage cans at home right now. We got houses for our garage, or we got cars, houses for our cars called garages. <laughs> like, we got money floating everywhere. Could you imagine leaving this place and then going to a place like that? This is what Jesus did. He left his palace and he came to this world. He left the best of the best. He gave up his divine privileges. He left heaven and he said, I know they're hurting. I know they're broken. They are poor in spirit. And what does he do? He comes into the middle of our mess. He's not scared of our mess. He comes into the middle of it to set us free. He humbled himself. Why should you make Jesus king of your life? Because he used his power to serve you. He uses his power to understand you. He uses his power to have compassion for your pain. He uses his power to come close to you. You want a Jesus and a God who had the human experience because he knows what you're walking through. I'm telling you, someone who knows what you're going through can lead you very well. That's Jesus. So he humbled himself and died a criminal's death. But three days later, is while we're here today, he became a victorious king. That's the second thing, why you should make him king. He's a victorious king. He came in a manger, right? And now he's sitting on the throne. Uh, Palm Sunday, he came riding Jerusalem on a donkey, a donkey's colt. And now he's coming back on a white horse. He died on the cross, but three days later, he rose victorious. And it says, now he is seated with his father in heaven. He is fully in charge, fully done, full authority. He has accomplished his work here on earth. He didn't just humble himself, but because he humbled himself, he is now victorious. And those who humble themselves will be victorious with Christ. So a king, right? A good king conquers. A good king has territory. A good king wins territory over and over. And if you are in Christ, you not only call him king, you have access to his kingdom. That's how God works. And so we have the scripture in Isaiah that gives us a peek on how big our God is. It says in Isaiah, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Yo, he's using the earth as an ottoman. He's just like, what's up, right? Like, he's just chilling. And I know people look at this, and they, this kind of is why people actually don't believe in our faith. Because they think God is a distant, far-out God who sees all this pain like I just told you about, and he wants nothing to do with it. And so he just sits back, and he's resting upon it. But think about this, right? All the wars, all the violence, all the pain, the suffering, the trials, the elections, and everything in between that's happening. He says, my feet are upon it. I'm resting on what you're worried about. I got control over what you're freaking out about. This isn't saying he's far off and he doesn't care about what's happening in our world. Actually, there's so many scripture that encourages his church to actually be the church. If he didn't care about this world, as soon as we made a decision to follow Jesus, he said, all right, come to heaven. But he left us here for a reason, so we would be the ones that would take care of poverty, so we would be the ones that would bring hope to the people in our workplaces, so we would be the ones who serve and take care of those who are being bullied. He says, no, I am not a far off God. My church just needs to step up and start being who I've called them to be, the body of Christ. Jesus is still walking this earth. It's called the church of Jesus Christ. He's still here. That's you and I. We are his choice to bring hope. So we're not just like, oh, he doesn't care. It's because the church hasn't cared. 
but he cares. That's not what this picture is. The picture is what he's trying to say is, I have authority over it all. It's supposed to give you rest that whatever seems big in your life right now, he's got it as an ottoman. And he says, you can trust in me. Why? Because what I can give you, if you choose me, my kingdom is beyond this world. And when this world ends, it's just beginning for those who are in Christ. That's why Jesus, before he went to the cross, at the end of his life, he's at the last supper and he's encouraging his disciples and he tells them this. He says, I have told you these things. What things, Sean? Previous to the last supper, he's sharing things like, hey, I'm gonna leave, but I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit who's gonna walk with you and talk with you and help you. The same spirit that's in me is gonna be with you. He's gonna help you. He talks about the vine and the branches, how he's the vine and we are the branches. And if you remain in him, he'll produce fruit. And apart from him, you can do nothing. He says, when you go through grief and trouble, I will bring you joy. That's these things he's talking about. He goes, now I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, here it is, you will have trouble. Can I just underline this? Because we got a lot of churches sometimes who forget to tell people they're still gonna have trouble even if they make Jesus king. I don't follow Jesus so I won't have trouble. I follow Jesus because I will have trouble. I don't have faith in Christ because I will have trials. I put my faith in Christ because I will have trials. I won't have trials because I will have trials. But what do you say? Take heart. Why? I've overcome the world. See, all the trials and the pain and everything, that's because of the world you're in. But I wanna let you know, I've overcome the entire world. So we can allow the world to overcome us or we can make King, or Jesus king and we can overcome the world. He's a humble king. He's a victorious king. And what we see in this moment is that Jesus laid his life down. He conquered sin for you and I and he conquered death, which means when death comes, we, sorry. <laughs> They're like, don't you wear sleeves ever again. I'm like, fine, I'm wearing a tank top next week. All right, so <laughs> I promise I won't, Bryce. All right, so I have overcome the world. This is encouraging. He's letting us know that no matter what you go through, if you make me king, it's not that you won't have trouble, but it's going to be temporary compared to living forever with him. You can have hope in the middle of trial because he's a good king. That's why Paul tells the church in Rome, he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, no, in all these things, what? We are more than conquerors. Sean, what does it mean to be more than conquerors? Let me unpack this because this is awesome. This word more than conquerors, first off, conquerors is the word Nikeo. It's where we get the word Nike. Just do it. <laughs> the word more than conquerors is hyper Nikeo, which means super conquerors. So he's not saying we conquer because Jesus conquered. He says we actually are more than conquerors because Jesus conquered. See, in this time frame, people in military battles would actually go and conquer land. But then they would come back with the riches and everything in that land. So they would come back more than conquerors because they didn't just conquer, they received all the riches and benefits of the battle. Let me say it this way. If you find a boxer who has a family and he's going to fight the fight of his life and if he wins, he gets a $10 million purse. His family loves him. They're so scared they don't even go to the, they don't even go to the match because they don't wanna watch it. He gets in that ring and he gets beat up. He gets punched in the face. He gets punched in the jaw. I mean, he's bleeding. He's bruised up. His face is swollen. But by the end of the fight, he knocks the other guy out and he's laying there. He's beaten, but he wins. He is a conqueror. And then he gets $10 million. And he takes that $10 million. He runs home to his family and he says, we won. Wait a second. They did nothing. Can you imagine he goes, you don't get any of this. I won. No, no, no. He says, we won. You know what that means? It means he took the blows in the ring, but his family get the riches of the blows. Jesus went into our ring. He paid our price. His body was whipped for us. His body was bruised for us. 
He went upon that cross and sin took him out. But three days later, he gave the knockout blow to the enemy. And the moment he did that, you became more than a conqueror because we now receive the inheritance, the riches, the promise for those who put their faith in Christ. Jesus conquered, but if you're in Christ, we are more than conquerors because we didn't fight the battle, but we received the blessings of it. Just saying, he's a good king. He's a good king. But here's the thing that we got to talk about before we end is that we look at the scripture and the reason he did all of this <laughs> is because love. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Amen. Nothing can separate you from the love of our Father. Like, Sean, I don't even believe right now. He loves you. Sean, you don't know what I did this week. He loves you. Nothing can separate you from that love, and this is why he did this, because he loves us. You can go back one. I don't want that one yet, if you could. Because here's the issue with this scripture, though. Because of his love, we are more than conquerors. But a lot of people see the scripture and they go, oh, I love this. God's love. And it's true. But what they do is they superimpose this and they think it says something that it's not saying. Yes, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He loves you. But I have found out in my life that I love people who still reject me. I love people who I've had to let go of because of the decisions they were making. I love people who are still in addiction and some who are still in prison. That prison's not separating their love from me, but they've chose to reject and make choices that put them in other places. And so people look at the scripture and say, man, God loves me. I'm good to go. But there's a lot of people who are gonna reject that love. And we have to talk about that today because he is a humble king, he's a victorious king. But listen, nothing can separate us from the love of God but nothing will also separate us from the judgment of God. And I know that's the part of the Easter message, like, oh, here it is. No, 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 you gotta look at the first two points. It's his kindness that leads to repentance. It's what he laid on the cross for us so that we could have this in the first place and nothing will separate us from the love of God. Do you know what separates us from God? Us, our choice. He's laid it out for us. He loves us and he's ready to do it. So he's a humble king, he's a victorious king, but he's also a just king. And this one's hard to swallow sometimes because we don't see love and justice as the same thing. But I'll tell you, love and justice is the same thing. You see, we didn't get away with our sin. No, no, it was paid in full. Jesus paid it in full. Jesus laid his life down on the cross. When people say, man, is God fair? He's very fair. It may feel like he's not fair to us because Jesus went to the cross, but someone had to die because it says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus knew that. And so the cross displays the love that Jesus has for us, but it also reveals the justice that had to take place. So the wrath of God over all the sin could be extinguished. And in that moment on the cross, the wrath that God had towards our sin was pummeled upon his son. In that moment, Jesus became sin on the cross. And then he abandoned his son right there so that those who put their trust in God will never be abandoned by God. Jesus was abandoned, so we would never be abandoned. But we have to receive that. And on his last breath in John, it says, then he bowed his head. But what did he say? It is finished. Finished. This word finished is the word tetelestai. It's a Greek word. And it's used in a quite different places. But in the business context, the word tetelestai means a receipt you get after doing business. It's a receipt that when there was a payment that was due, once that debt is paid and fulfilled, you get a tetelestai. It's a receipt saying it was paid in full. It's also a judicial context. It means that when someone has to serve a sentence, when it was to tell us that, it means that person served the sentence to the full. It is finished, to tell us that. It also is a military term. That when you went to battle, to tell us that meant that when you went and you fought a war, it means the battle had been won, the battle is over, and you are victorious. So when Jesus uttered the words, to tell us that, it is finished. What he was saying was the debt because of our sin had been paid in full, the judgment because of our sin sentence has been paid in full, and the battle has already been won and overcome. If you want to receive it, I can be your king. You got to put your trust in me. So Paul tells his protege, Timothy, in a church, he says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, 
who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. He goes on to give him encouragement and word. But I want you to understand, he's saying, Timothy, whatever you do, remember this. Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead. Who's the living? Those who made Jesus king. Who's the dead? Those who are still dead in their trespasses because they have not received the free gift of grace. That's what he's saying. We're gonna have to meet him face to face. It, it reminded me of the story as we close. It was this moment where we were in high school and my parents were going out for the weekend and they said, you guys can, you and my brother, you guys can have a couple friends over. So that night about midnight, there was about 40 people at our house and uh, <laughs> someone decided to get a fog machine out and we blasted so much fog in that, that house. Every square inch was full. You could not see your hand in front of you. And I remember being in there and getting hit with toilet paper rolls, like where'd that come from? And things crashing in the distance and smelling things like I'm like, uh-oh, like this isn't turning into a good party, oh no. And I remember being in that moment and we just kept going all night. It was about four or five in the morning and my family was gonna come home early morning and so we decided, okay, we gotta empty out the house. It looked like our house was on fire. The smoke was just pummeling out of the house. We started cleaning up. We kicked all of our friends out besides a couple and then my parents got home and we thought we got away with it. Like, did it, crushed it. My parents walk in, they say, how was your time? Like, it was great. Just a couple of us having a good time, right? And in that moment, as they were there, we thought we got away with it. My mom says something in the distance. She goes, what is all this white film all over the mirrors and all over the shelf? We didn't know it was an oil-based fog machine and it left a residue all over the house. <laughs> sure enough, we had to talk to dad. And then we were grounded. And it, and I did some things that got me in trouble in high school, but I did a lot of things in high school also I chose not to do because I knew I would get in trouble. And the reason I chose not to put myself in trouble because I knew at the end of trouble, I was gonna have to talk to dad. So I just didn't do it. Now, my dad loved me. He cared for me. I didn't wanna disappoint him. And we have a lot of people living this life thinking, I'm just going to rule my own life. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to do whatever I can, thinking I can make the best decisions. And at the end of the life, I'm hopefully just going to scrape by, and then maybe I can just get away with it. And the truth is, there's a lot of people living this life not realizing that you're going to have to talk to dad at the end. You're going to have to talk to God. There's going to be him. He's going to stand there in that moment. He's going to look at us, and he's going to say, did you put your trust in my son? Because if you did, you are in the family of God. But if you didn't, you are now separated from me forever. Here's the truth about Jesus being king. He is king whether we believe it or not. And scripture says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So we can see Jesus as king and voluntarily bow now, or we can reject him as king and mandatory bow when we see him face to face. I encourage you to do it when you can voluntarily do it and live a life following him as king. Why? So that you don't have to look at him face to face. And he says, I gave this to you. And you rejected it. Don't go another day rejecting Jesus as king. He loves you. He cares for you. And so right now, I'm gonna give you that moment. Who cares what people think about you? Listen, the person next to you, don't worry about them. You're not gonna have to see them at the end of your life. You're gonna have to see God in Jesus. So with eyes closed, if you're here and you just need to take a moment to focus on God, Scripture says, how can I make Jesus king? It's simple. Receive the love. Receive the grace. Put your faith in him. It says, believe that Jesus was God. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for my sin. He said, it is finished. And today, or three days later, he rose from that grave and he makes me a new person. And I'm going to make him king. If you want to make him king today, right now, here's a prayer you can pray. You say, God. Thank you for sending Jesus for my sin. I need a savior. Forgive me today. I'm done ruling my life. I make you king of my life. I choose you today. I put my trust in you. I put my faith in you today. I lay myself to the side and I say, Lord, you are my savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer, 
please, in a moment, do not hesitate. We're gonna do something. If you're here, if you're in overflow, if you're online, I wanna ask you to do something. It's gonna be a simple obedience, but I promise you there is power in obedience. If you made Jesus king of your life, we wanna celebrate you today and we wanna get you a resource before you head out that's gonna help you with that decision you made. If that was you, I just want you at the count of three to lift up your hand. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. Three, if you said, I made, Je I made Jesus king of my life today, could you throw your hand up as high as you can in the overflow in here and say, that was me. I chose to put my faith in Jesus. If you're here today, we want to give you something. We're going to give a moment, okay? If there's anyone in the overflow, make sure if you're hearing me out in the overflow, if there's someone out there to give them a box. Amen. Well, let's thank God for King Jesus today and everything he has done in our life. Well, every weekend, it is so exciting to see people taking next steps in their faith journey. Now here at Vail, we believe that everybody has a next step to take, and so the question is, what's yours? We believe and trust that some people today, they made the next step of following Jesus for the first time, but maybe you've made that decision before. Your next step may be getting baptized, or it may be jumping into a small group community, or starting to serve here at Vail in some capacity. Whatever your next step is, we want to partner with you in that, because we believe that nobody goes on this journey alone. And so to partner with you in your next step, we want to ask you to text the word next to the number on the screen, or you can fill out the My Next Step card from the seat in front of you and drop that into one of our drop boxes or bring that out to the info counter because we want to partner with you in that. Now, again, if you are visiting with us today, you've already taken the next step because you're here. And we are so excited and so grateful that you chose to come and be with us this weekend. I want to remind you, text the word next to that number, fill out the next step card, and something else is going to happen. Because if you're visiting with us and you text that number or you turn that card in, we're also going to make a one-time donation to a local ministry partner just because you are here. Now, the reason we do that is because here at Vail, we believe that we are called to give generously, that God has wired us for generosity, and that it is something God wants for you and not from you. And so if you would like to participate in giving here at Vail and partner with us in all that God is doing in and through his church, there are several ways that you can do that. If you brought cash or check donations, you can put those in any of our drop boxes located on the walls at both exits or out in the lobby. But you also can give digitally as well by going to our website, veil.church. You can text the word veil to 77977, or you can give using the free Veil Church app. Now, as we get ready to dismiss here in just a few moments, I want to invite you guys out in the lobby. You guys can go ahead and stand up and start making your way to pick your kids up or get on out. And so we can start collecting shares out there and get ready for our next service. If you are in the room, I want to invite you to hang with me for about 30 seconds so we can get some room made out there. And as we dismiss today, we're going to keep this room a little quieter. And if you would like to take communion, we've got that available down here on our stage. And if you would like prayer for anything, members of our prayer team, Team are down here ready to meet you. We are so glad that you are here today with us, and we want to invite you back next week as we start our new series, I Love Jesus, But Not the Church. And next week, we are back to our normal service time, Saturday at 4 o'clock, and then Sunday at 9 and 11. We are so glad you guys are here with us this weekend. We hope that you have a great rest of Easter weekend. We are celebrating a risen king. And so let's go out and share that with others. You guys are dismissed.